Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining our first webinar. Uh, this is going to be a series of many events that we're planning to host, um, either in-person events or online. Um, we, we're quite keen to um, start this one off with a women in business sort of emphasis, because that's really the, the theme of what we're trying to promote. Um, my name is Soha Ola. I've been working with London South Bank for quite a while now on a number of programs, one of them being uh, uh, exec education and getting people into business, giving them support. We have a number of fantastic programs, which I can talk about afterwards, that will help businesses start up, uh, grow and develop over the, over the course of time. So if you have any questions regarding that, happy to, uh, to be here. We've got three fantastic uh, speakers. We've got um, Samira Asgar, who's the founder of um, Imanza Art, is that right? Yes. Imanza Art, yeah. Brilliant. We've got Zahir Khan, who's the uh, founder of um, Faya Cafe. Is that right? Yeah, fair. Excellent. Oh, and wow. Mah and Maham Ali, who's a founder of Shop Maya. Hi. Amazing. <laughs> Excellent. Well, um, what, what I would like to do is um, if you guys introduce yourself to the uh, to the speaker, sorry, to the audience, tell them about, about yourself, the journey you've been on, um, we've got a Q&A session, so if any of the participants want to send in questions, please feel free and we can ask them during our Q&A session. But um, let's start off with Maham. If you start off with your, your journey, tell us about who you are and your background and so on, that would be fantastic. Perfect. <clears throat> so sharing a bit of my journey and um, a little bit of background. So I ventured into the space of e-commerce last June, 2023. Um, but before that, I've had an online presence since the last five, six years, um, because I've had, um, I'm a blogger by profession. And um, so basically, do I, do I tell you the journey of how I started blogging or how I came mm -hmm. into Shop Maya? Mm -hmm. Because both are correlated. The, the short okay. journey, so whichever you feel, um best sort of describe your journey feel free please okay perfect so um when i ventured into um blogging it was pretty pretty new and not many people were on the app of instagram and i started this about six seven years ago when i got married and i got shifted to paris and paris was a very it was a very it was a very new start for me because mm -hmm. uh, because the language barrier, um, I wasn't able to work. Um, I I was it was a whole it it was nothing like Emily in Paris, but um, mm -hmm. but but I started my uh, I I I was always very passionate about writing about taking pictures, so that is when you know this this app was. It, it, it was very budding, it was very new. And by my personality, I'm I'm very dramatic. I, um, <laughs> like my, my entire family, I was born in and raised in a family. We are avid movie watchers, appreciators of good music. We love, you know, we, we, we're kind of like singing and dancing. Extremely emotional by nature. And I've always loved expressing my emotions. So I think Paris became that canvas and that inspiration for me where I, um, where I just channeled sort of all my energy and my experiences on this app on Instagram. Um, from then, this was 2017. And from then, when I started doing that, um, I sort of gained uh, a community. I, I gained an audience who could relate with my experiences, who real, like, you know, I realized I had an audience who was not there for me just with my ups and downs while I was sharing my journey as an expat. They were with me for not just my lifestyle content, but they were also looking at me for my fashion content as well. Um, I think representing um, a normal body type, which just wasn't, you know, your regular Insta perfect goals life was something very relatable for people. So I started getting a lot of messages from girls who had um, similar body types or who were also conscious about themselves or just, you know, stay at home moms and wives who have newly shifted, uh, who were looking at me for advice, not just for life, but fashion and styling as well. Um, then COVID came. So during COVID, I saw um, a lot of 
I gained a lot of traffic on my page. And that traffic was basically, at that time, I actually got an opportunity from a small business who wanted to partner with me for shoes. And they wanted to create a line around my blog, around my personality. And that is how I went into like product placement. And I started um, channeling my creativity, my campaign, and you know, that sort of, that sort of gave me a lot of motivation and confidence that, okay, this is something that, you know, what if I have something of my own? What if I start curating products? And what if I start, um, because, you know, I've clearly done something to get here, to have brand partnerships where, you know, I can I can create campaigns around around my brand, around my personality, and brands love it. So why not have my own product? Why not have my own storyline? And that is how Shop Maya came into life about last year. And I combined my love for everything, filmy, everything dressing up, and I launched this online shop, which would entail you just feeling fabulous in your own self and most importantly channeling main character feels of your life through my products whenever and however you want <laughs> oh that's brilliant sorry yeah. I, I know that was a lot of no lot of... <laughs> i think that was, that was so informative lovely oh no, that was amazing it's, it's quite a nice story because it's it's your personal journey i think a lot of a lot of us who start these businesses they have a personal background story of why we want to do this. So exactly. I think that's that's a good way to motivate people as well because some people go into business just to start up a business. Mm, and exactly. quite often you don't have the same drive and determination if it's not personal to yourself. Yeah, that's true. That's so, true. So that, that was I, fantastic. So go thank on, sorry. you. Thank you so much. I I think my vision with Maya is that, you know, I, I want to bring in more of our local artisans and more of our products. And since I have a growing Insta space and the audience looks up to me for like um, my own dressing up and my own, um, how, you know, how I curate myself and my journey. So it's it's such a growing space. There's so much that I can do with it. And this is just only the start. Fantastic. Do you want to give everyone the, the Insta page so you know, people can join? Uh, yes, the, uh, yes, the... for sure. My Insta page is called Desi Baguette. Sorry, that should have been my opening sentence. <laughs> <Bye. Bye. laughs> What's it called, Desi Baguette? Yes, because I started my journey in Paris and I was very much into yeah. my Desi roots. So that, that seemed like the perfect oh, blend wow. of both cultures. And my shop's name is The Shop Maya. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, Hope everyone goes and uh, join your Instagram page today. I'm actually stalking it. I'm actually stalking the page right now. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, wow. Brilliant. So, oh, my God, I love it. So Thank what, you. One of, the, one of the questions we've just had in was, what were the challenges that you faced um, that, you know, either with, you know, friends or family that you managed to overcome? Because all a lot of us who start these new businesses, we tend to rely, um, you know, on advice from friends or family. So one of the questions we've got is what were the challenges that you, you face and how did you overcome it? So in terms of like uh, my friends and family, they have been nothing but supportive. They have nothing been like my biggest cheerleaders are my friends and my family. And Shop Maya is actually kind of like a family project as well because I involved my sister with me. She's based in Pakistan. She's a brilliant graphic designer. So I got her into uh, creating the packaging for us, do the basically the branding. She's the best person who knows me, my personality. So I just handed over the concept to her and I was like, you know, you just create, you, you know, the storyline. So just create the branding. So she did fantastic branding for it. My dad was actively participating in it, getting us vendors for the packaging. And like my mom was giving us ideas, my my whole fam, like, you know, I it I I knew if I'm just going to spread the word on on my WhatsApp that you know this is something that I'm starting, my family and friends would be there for me. Just last month I did my first, very first exhibit as well for Shop Maya. And I think no, I'm not mentioning for Nazar or anything, but my my stall was the busiest because my friends and family were there to support me. So oh, wow. Alhamdulillah, no, no, no challenges in terms of my friends and family. They've been my biggest support system and strength to fall back onto. 
fantastic. That's brilliant. We, we have quite a few questions, but what I'll do in the Q and A session, I'll raise them. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll bring them in. Um, so following on from that, so firstly, that was a really good story. I really appreciate the, the journey you've been on. It's quite amazing. Um, Thank you. Moving on to our next speaker, uh, Zara, could you just introduce yourself? Um, tell us about, about your business. If there's any websites or anything that you want to plug, here's a great time to do it. Um, over to you. Hi, I'm um, Zara Khan, and by profession, I'm a chef. I trained at uh, Gordon Ramsay's uh, Academy, and um, I have actually been into baking since I was eight years old. Um, that's when I baked my first cake, and I used to very fondly um, just be in the kitchen with my mom, you know, any chance I would get baking cupcakes and cakes. And it was just um, something that I was encouraged to keep up as a hobby. I was actually studying to become a doctor, and uh, so I, my family moved to Canada and I was studying um, medicine. And it was uh, when I was in university that I just started um, my own business of cakes. And I was pulling all nighters, finishing wedding cakes <laughs> and then giving exams back to back. So it was really stressful, but I felt like my passion, um, cake making, cake decorating, it was so therapeutic for me that that is what actually got me through university because it was quite a tough time for me. I wasn't sure if that is the career path I wanted, um, but I kept on going. I graduated and then I had the difficult conversation with my parents that I don't want to go to med school and um, instead I want to become a chef. And I remember it didn't go down very well. And it was just, um, you know, I took some time trying to convince them. And then very interestingly enough, I was traveling and I came to London and I just fell in love with the city. And I told my parents, I want to move to London and I want to go to culinary school here. So it took some convincing, but, you know, here I am. And um, eight years later, you know, um, founder of FEA, we've got three locations. And um, it's it's honestly, you know, you know, when they say you really have to be, when you're passionate about something and you believe in yourself, um, it really does wonders. And, you know, today my parents are so proud of me uh, for everything that I have accomplished. And um, it doesn't, you know, if you, if they say that if you're passionate um, about your work, it doesn't feel like you worked a day in your life. And mm -hmm. it, it's so true that, you know, every single day, no matter how stressed out I am, how hectic my routine is, I'm working around the clock, um, it, it doesn't feel like I'm working at the end of the day because it just, you know, there's this passion that's the driving force. Um, and yeah, so it's been a journey. It's it's not been an easy one. Um, the first fair was open six years ago at the same time that I became a mother for the first time. So it was basically juggling motherhood and um, a newly opened business. Back in 2018, London was very competitive. It wasn't an easy market, um, especially as a startup with no experience. So there were lots of challenges that we faced initially. Um, there's, there's been lots of learning along the way. Um, and, you know, then COVID hit and we really had to rethink everything because the businesses were shut. Um, and as a new business, you know, it wasn't easy to navigate because we just there was so much uncertainty. Um, so that's when we actually um, took the time to launch a retail line. So instead of just having a cafe and restaurant, we thought, you know, what if we can um, bring our products, our customers can order online. And it's something that, um, you know, it's something that we always wanted to do, uh, but just never got around to doing. So it was the perfect time for us to get together. Um, we got a team of uh, female illustrators on board. The products that we designed, each message has... Um, each product has a message of motivation um, for women. And for example, these are all about self-care. Um, chocolate bars are reach for the stars. So every product has a has a unique message that we want to convey. Um, and in line with our retail line, we also um, launched Fair Cares, which is our charity. So 10% of the profits uh, from Fair, from the sales of Fair uh, retail go towards uh, our charity Fair Cares which um, works alongside many other charities. For example, we work with Refuge, which is a charity for women um, and children. We work with British Heart Foundation. Um, so multiple charities um, along the way. And you know that's just one of the ways that we sort of give back. Um, 
which is you know one of the corner stores of the business is we believe in giving back um and the other thing is women empowerment, which has always been, you know, what the business has been focused on. We've got a 70% female workforce, um, lots of single mothers are employed as well. When I first opened, this is um, one of the things, because I was a young mother myself, I employed a lot of mothers um, to work for me. And a lot of them did not have the experience at the time, but I believe that, you know, I can give them the skills and and they can go on to open up their own businesses. Um that wasn't the best idea initially because I really struggled with training the staff and with getting the team together. Um, and then I realized, you know, staffing is is on. It's an ongoing issue. So in this in this sort of industry, it's it's uh, constant. You know, it, staff comes and goes, and and that's something that you know I've just learned along the way. Um. So yeah, that's fair in a nutshell. Oh wow! Excellent. I mean, that's fascinating story. And, you know, it must be interesting working uh, or being part of the Gordon Ramsay uh, uh, training session. I'm sure you have uh, quite a few stories to tell uh, from those days. Um, so just a couple of questions we've just had in. Um, to do with, uh, like, you know, mentorship or, you know, would you have benefited if you had, like, a mentor who was guiding you through your journey without something beneficial to you? Um, and, you know, for new you know, starters... Would you recommend them look for a mentor or would you say learn learn on your own and then once you develop grow from there what would you what would be your recommendation uh yes definitely 100 percent. i feel like if i had a mentor or somebody just you know with prior experience um you know in the hospitality industry it would have been really helpful mm-hmm. um and it takes time you know you make your mistakes and then you learn but the thing is, London um, is really competitive, especially the hospitality industry. And, and especially nowadays, it's just become even more competitive. And you don't have that that time, you know, to give it a chance and to make your mistakes and to learn. So mm-hmm. it really is time dependent. And it would have made a huge difference, you know, personally, if I had the mentor. But if, um, you know, I would advise anybody looking up to set up their own businesses that definitely get help, seek advice. Um, and, you know, get all the information you can, because there was just so many things that we weren't aware of when we first started FAIR, um, just local laws and, you know, um, it, there's just so many different things that it, it's really helpful, you know, just just speak to people and, and, and everybody's really helpful, you know, once you um, start seeking guidance, you know, there's, there's, there's so many resources out there. Excellent. Fantastic. Oh, that's so amazing. So thank you very much for that. It was really, uh, really informative. Thank you. Um, we'll move over to Samira. If you want to, again, introduce yourself, um, any uh, websites or any Instagram pages that, that we need to go and join, um, please feel free to, uh, you know, floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Right, so my name is Samira Asghar. Uh, I am a contemporary abstract artist. Uh, my Instagram name is Imanza Art. Um, so I specialize in contemporary abstract So all of my work is bespoke and it's commission based. So people commission me for artwork and that's what I do. Um, At the moment, I am working with celebrities, sports personalities, and most of my clientele are um, high high profile clientele. So I'll go into how I started this journey. It's pretty mad, but I'll I'll go into it. So I did it in school. So I did art in school. I did GCSEs and I did A-levels. So um, when I did my A-levels uh, and we had our, ex- um, when the, all the examiners came, the modulators and stuff to come and it, mark the examination and stuff, we had some come from Oxford University as well for the art. So I remember one of my art pieces, the exam pieces that was in there, um, one of the uh, examiners from Oxford said, could we take this back for an exhibition that we're having over there? But because all the examiners needed to come in and it needs to be examined, um, we could we couldn't let we couldn't let them take it. But I remember the teachers coming back to me and saying, Your work was asked to be taken back to Oxford. And at the time I didn't think anything of it. I just thought, oh really? Oh, that's cool. Because obviously I'm 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 a teenager, I'm just like I'm doing my artwork and I didn't think anything of it. And I was quite I was quite sporty and I always have been. So I was more into my basketball because I was playing basketball at the time and I was playing at a really like elite level kind of thing and then I I, later I went into coaching like under 16s and stuff so the art for me was something that I do and I knew I was good at at it but I didn't think like um I was going to make anything of it 
But um, as we went along, um, so I've been, I, I didn't end up going to university because I got married quite young. I got married at the age of 20. So what ended up happening was I carried on with the sports side. I didn't really give the art side any sort of like attention. I just thought it was something I just enjoy doing and I'm good at it. I get the good grades and that's it. And then what happened, my friend, Rihanna, so she's a, another, like, she's a Pakistani girl. And um, she went on to playing for GB in basketball, whereas I ended up getting married. So I was absolutely gutted thinking it was my choice to get married. But the fact that I couldn't carry on with the whole basketball and stuff, I I went into coaching. So I had my first baby, Iman, and obviously motherhood took over. So I was looking after Iman and stuff. And then within a year after I had Hamza, so I had Iman and Hamza. So when I had Hamza, I got an email from my art tutor, Miss Morrison, and she said to me, um, I just want to know what you're doing with your art. And, I, and then I, I remember emailing her back saying, what do you mean? I said, I'm not doing anything with it. And then, she, and then and she messaged me saying, I want you to create something because I do not want you to throw your talent away. So I thought a teacher's being a teacher and she, she always pushed me through like A-levels and, uh, and everything and said like, you know, I want you to create this, go and do this. And go. she'd just tell me to just go and do it. And I'd just go and do it. And it, it, it was God. So then this time she emailed me after I had my second um, baby. And at the time I was thinking like, I need to do something. And I was more interested towards like architecture or something. So I wanted to go back to uni. So anyway, she sent me this email. So I, um, I, I, I said to her, right, fine, do you know what, I'll do it. I went into my garage, I went and got my canvas, I went and bought paints and everything. Went into the garage, put my easel up and thought, wow, it's been ages, I've not done this. It's been like a good few years. But then I thought, do you know what? I'm just going to do it. And I, I specialize in abstract art. So it's like basically deconstruction of everything and then creating something impossible, but making it possible kind of thing. Something you've not seen before. Because I love the beauty and the, the, and the originality in the authenticity of the art. Something that you've not ever seen before and I've created it. So your eyes never seen that. So, so for me, that's always been really fascinating when it comes to art. So then I started creating it. So I created this um, cityscape, but it was all abstract. And it went from blue to um, red and yellowy orangey tones. No, it went from blue to yellowy green to red. And the orangey tones are in the middle. So as I was creating it, I was thinking like, what am I doing? Like, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I had no clue what I was doing, but it was turning into something. And then I finished it. And then I told her, I finished it. She goes, send me a picture. So I sent her the picture. And it was like a, a meter and a half by a meter. It was big because I only work on big, big art. I can't do small art. I can't do fiddly stuff. It has to be big. So um, I created it, sent it to her. And then she said, right, I want you to register with an art gallery now and send them your art piece. And I said, and what will they do? She goes, they'll just sell it on. So I was like, oh my God. So I said, right, fine, I'll do it. I registered it that night. And by morning, I put, I just made up a price and I put it on. I put it on for a thousand pound. I didn't take it seriously. I just put it on for a thousand pound. And I thought, let's see what happens. The next day it got sold to an American, American client that took the piece and said, I want it like straight away. So when I saw that, at that point, I was like, holy crap. Like there's something like, you know, uh, and then, then my business sort of had started like coming into play because I come from a family of business, like my dad, my dad's in business, my husband's in business, my brother's in business, everyone's like an entrepreneur. So I think that I just naturally get that from my dad because my dad was always like that. So straight away, I started thinking, oh my God, that's that's something there. It didn't take me long to do it. It's just that I, I, I thought of something out of the box and I put it online and that sold for a thousand pounds. And I thought that's crazy. So then what I did was I started creating pieces. I stayed with the same art gallery for a while, but I think I stayed with them for like two years. And I was creating it, but then they get a certain commission out of my work. And then and and then at the, at the time it was working for me because I thought I've got the kids. I'm not going to put, I, I didn't put my 100% into the business side. I thought they, they're doing that side. So leave, leave them to it. All I'm doing is creating the art and then just passing them the pictures. And as soon as it goes, it goes. So for about two years, I did that. And then I did exhibitions. I worked with a few different galleries. And then about five, I think only about five years ago, um, I took the business to Instagram. And then... Um, it literally just took off from there. Then I had to be dead strategic about it when it comes to to um, business online. And I started thinking about how to display this online and what market I want to like target. So then I thought if my pieces that I just started 
in the beginning sold for a thousand pounds, which it which means I need to be targeting the higher end market. So then from there, Instagram's a tool. It's a free tool that we've all got. We're not paying for it. It's free marketing online. So I thought I'm gonna make I'm gonna take advantage of that. So that's exactly what I did. I targeted high profile clientele. Um, I started working with I, I worked with a few influencers at the start and we did it as collaborations. And then we, I went on to working with um, sports pers personalities, celebrities. The more I've worked with them, the more my work got out there to different different types of people. Um, and then that's it. The rest is history. And that's how my art business came about. And now I am known amongst the Asian community as Imanza Art. Well, I've been on your Instagram page and it's amazing. I have to be honest with you. Highly recommended to anyone who just 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 go on the page because it's the, the artwork is absolutely fantastic. Oh, so, thank um, you. Yeah. Thank you so much. But then, um, so then what the thing was, when I first started this, obviously it was a passion. Yeah. And um, as I went along over the years, people wanted to learn how to do it. I had loads of people copying the artwork as well, which is fine. I At first it bugged me, but then I started taking it as a compliment because I was thinking, okay, if I'm inspiring people, it, it's fine. It's all good. Like, you know, whatever's written for them is written for them. Whatever's written for me is written for me. It's absolutely fine. Uh, but what then what I did find was, I did do a few workshops, but with art, what I realized with art is, is you've either got it or you haven't. You're either cr a creative or you're not. You're born with it. And no matter how much I try to teach that, I will not be able to teach it. I can teach you how to paint. I can teach you how to blend. I can teach you how to look at things from a perspective. But when it comes to putting that down to a canvas or a piece of paper, whether you're sketching, whether you're drawing, whether you're painting, what you're going to create of that is all down to you. That has to come from within. If it comes from within, then you're going to absolutely create something spectacular and it will relate with people. Um, and then another thing is like, I always saw it, see if you're passionate about something and you've got a gift is obviously given by God, it's given by Allah and it's given for a reason. So as the years went on, I started to, to think like, I started to think differently that this just can't be it. Like I've, I've not just like my teacher did not just approach me and said, get onto this gallery and put your art out there. And that's it. That, and this is it. You're an artist, you paint. And, and this is all it is. I thought there has to be more to it. And because I'm a contemporary abstract artist, what ended up happening after, uh, through the journey was I started getting clients that started requesting Islamic calligraphy. And mm -hmm. I'm not a trained Islamic calligraphy artist. So what, what I did then was when people started ordering those, I, I took that as a challenge and I did Urdu in um, A-level as well. And I was really good at, I was really good at it. So I knew how to write Urdu, but I, I did not know how to write Arabic. Mm -hmm. So what I did, I combined my Arabic with the Urdu and turned my calligraphy into something of my own. So then it sort of turned into this abstract calligraphy thing that's obviously people like were really drawn to. So then I thought, okay, like there's a market here. There's a market here for aesthetically pleasing looking art. I don't have to sit here and create something that I feel like creating because this is business now. I'm thinking on a business level. I'm not looking at art as this is my passion and I'm going to, I'm just going to create for the sake of creating and let people see what I'm creating. So I'm not creating collect collectibles or a collection of work. I started thinking like, okay, this is business. I need to get the work out there and I need clients. So I'm only going to create on commission based so and that's what started happening and then what I realized was I'm putting Islamic calligraphy in people's homes so whether it's alhamdulillah whether it's subhanallah whether it's Allah Akbar, whether it's like husband anything it is it's it's a dua it's, it's zikr it's Allah's name it's in people's homes and people are reciting that because of me and, and they're looking at it and it's like I and I've done that and every time they recite it it's like I'm getting the rewards to it. I get I get so emotional when I talk about it because it's like it's passion, but then it's like Allah's turned it into into this thing that rewards me as well. So, oh my God, why am I crying? This is really. <laughs> it's, it's I wasn't passion supposed to cry, right? <laughs> I crop this bit out, okay? But this, I'm not supposed <laughs> to crying. But anyway, so um, yeah, so that's what happened. So basically, that's my journey. In, in the art side. And then I obviously went into my second business, which is in travel because art and travel go hand in hand. And then what I started, what I did, and that's not that old. That was only like about nine months ago, I went into travel. So I travel quite a bit. Um, my children are international kickboxers. My son is number ranked number one in the world. Okay. My daughter, Iman, is British champion. 
Um, so we travel the world quite a bit and I came across this business opportunity that allows you to save on your travel and it also allows you to earn whilst you book travel and it also allows you to earn a residual income so you have got passive income to give yourself financial freedom. So that's a business that I ventured into and alhamdulillah that sort of just took off as well because art and travel going together, my kids kickboxing careers and me traveling, all of that goes hand in hand. Um, and basically in a nutshell, that's what I do and that's, and that's it. But I wasn't meant to cry. We're going to scrub that bit out, okay? We'll, we'll scrub that. Yeah. Look, that's an amazing story, amazing journey. And most people are asking, how do you fit everything in in 24 hours? Because you seem to be doing so much, so much fantastic I'll you, stuff. I'll, I'll, I've got the answer to that finally, like okay. 20 years later. Do you know, it, when somebody asks me, how do you do it all? Like, obviously, I've got four kids. I've got two businesses. Yeah. And um, we travel the world quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, my answer to that is when, when you want to do something and get something done, you do it yeah. and you get it done. Yeah. Literally, that is the only, if, if I've got something to do and I and I know like this this meeting was meant to happen today, I had 50 billion other things to do, but I've man managed to fit, fit it in because I wanted to give it priority because I think it's an amazing concept that you guys have come up with. So um, when, when you're determined to do something, I, I think it's determination. If you're determined to do it, you'll do it. And there's no secret. There's no, there's no secret. There's no hidden potion that I'm drinking and I'm like superwoman. There isn't. Literally, I get that all the time. Um, but it's 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 basically make the intention of doing it and get it done. Just don't wait around. Don't waste your time. Whatever needs doing, get it done. That's how you're going to get it done, basically. It's as simple as that. Well, I mean, all three speakers, I'd say you've been absolutely impressive. And quite frankly, you know, the, the journeys you've been on are inspiration to probably loads of people listening and other people, even the next generation, should be able to take inspiration from what you guys have done um, and carried on doing everything else as well. So for that, I, I'm very grateful for your time today. Um, it's been it's been great listening to your, uh, your journey that you've all been on. Um, so to, what we're going to do, we're going to move into a Q&A session shortly. So I just want to say to the uh, participants, if anyone wants to send in any questions, you've still got a few minutes. I've got several questions that have been handed over to me already. Um, so we'll start in a second. One of the areas I want to just also touch base on while waiting for more questions was you've got, there's a lot of, so I work for uh, London South Bank University, for example. There's a lot of initiatives that we've got that, you know, reach out to you know, business owners such as yourself to engage either as collaborative approaches or, or for training or so on. Now, you know, we, we, we are, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're thinking about doing an in-person event. So, Anyone who's on this call, happy for you to join. Please, please come along. But have you found there's been more um, involvement from, say, universities or outside businesses that are willing to provide you the support? Or have you found that they're not really there until you, know, you need them and then you know, then they're not at support? It would be interesting to get your perspective on the support that's out there from different organisations. So, is, that is that a question for us? Yeah, just just general, just a quick question for you guys. Just generally, do you find there's a support out there for helping you run your business or setting your business up? Um, or the do you support, see that like the, the, there's, the, there's the kind of support like on social media where you see all the ads and they can say that grow your business, do this and grow your business, yeah. do that. Like the social media ads, yeah. but like something like that's there, like university level kind of thing. No, I don't think I don't think I've come across anything. Yeah. I think um, be, like I've done my master's in business management, but I was just sharing with my husband that I think I haven't really applied my degree to <laughs> like anything that I'm doing in life now. And even though it was business management, but somehow it just does not feel relevant. Mm -hmm. And I think um, institutions wise, I don't think there has been any kind of like any place specific mm -hmm. or course that I've, you know, that is designed for us to reach out to. But as Zara said earlier, I think whenever you reach out to people or like business owners, they're always readily available to help. And they're always um, like, you know, people are very, very kind to like, you know, offer support and like share their experiences. But there's no such formal organization. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, what BPF is doing is really great. Like um, having a platform where, um, 
British Pakistanis and people like us are there to offer support and a platform um, for us to like, you know, gather and do collaborations and reach out to for mental purposes as well. So it's really comforting to know that. No, I agree. I mean, when, when we first engaged with uh, the BPF, I was quite keen to yeah. work with them because they they touch a, a, a demographics uh, exactly. with, you know, within London that we may not as a university really engage with. So it's been valuable to have them on board because of the hard work they're doing. So, you know, yeah. um, to all the people in the background of BPF, just a quick thank you for the efforts that you've done, especially Zara Khalid, who <laughs> I have to say she's, she's on mute, but she's done so much hard work to pull this through. <laughs> I just want to yeah. thank her um, publicly. So we've got a few questions here. Um, I'll ask them and feel free to jump in and ask uh, answer how you please. So, um, so I'll go for the first one. It says, um, can you share a pivotal moment in your career that significantly impacted your path or your journey to your business or to your, your next step in the business growth? Mm. That's open to all three of you, anyone who wants to jump in. Right, mine was I'll 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 just put right in there. Mine was when I when um when I told everyone like like basically like the community around I wouldn't specifically say family but everybody else like extended that when they realized I was doing something in art it was literally like I wouldn't say frowned upon but basically like what what is it what you're doing like you paint like they didn't really understand it so like. It's either like in the Asian community, either a doctor or you're a lawyer or you're an engineer or you're something like like you're a professional in something else. Whereas art is not looked upon as a as a thing, like a successful thing. So for me, it was to prove a point when that was said and I was doing what I was doing. At that point, I just thought, right, I'm going to shut up. I'm going to put my head down. And, you know, that saying work in silence and let success make make the noise. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I did. I just shut my mouth. I thought, guys, you lot want to talk, carry on talking. I'm going to work. And then I, I proved it. I literally proved it. I'm an Asian Pakistani Muslim woman. I'm in uh, the art industry. It's a creative industry and I'm successful in it. So and Alhamdulillah for that. And at the end of the day, that was a moment for me where I thought, right, I need to prove a point here. It wasn't that it's not that I, I really give like uh, importance to what people think, but I do care about what people think like. So, yeah, so I wanted to prove a point, and I did. Fantastic, fantastic. Zara Mahan, do you, do, you, do you want to add to that, or are you similar experiences for yourselves as well? Yeah, I was going to say, because because of the industry I'm in, um, you know, I, I like Sumaira said, you know, she had a point to prove. It was the same in my case. I feel I can uh, relate to her in a lot of ways, because um, especially coming from a Pakistani background, you know, um, women are just expected to cook at home and you know mm -hmm. mostly it's like about the traditional cooking at home and it's more out of that rather than making a career out of it and you know turning it, to, in, it into a profession so for me when that happened as well you know there were a lot of people basically just going oh you're you're a chef but that's not really you know mm -hmm. career um, or a profession or like how you're going to make a living out of this um, and so you know it's it's later on then opening Feao the one location and the second location then getting the recognition by Forbes um, you know all of that was mm. just sort of you know just pushing me towards okay you know I'm doing the right thing and it just it you know it has to come from within you and um, that sort of just paved the path for me and, and you know now like I'm really proud of all that I've achieved and you know, it's it's like you never stop learning. So every day it's like you're learning new things and, and that's the beauty of it. Excellent, excellent. Maham, do you want to add to that? Or... Yeah, um, I think um, for, so you asked for a pivotal moment in my career. I think just the fact that, you know, I was able to make blogging a career was something that was that was the world evolving itself that it happened. Um, yes, people liked my content. They liked, um, they reciprocated and they, you know, they related with it. But um, the world itself was evolving with it. That's why I was able to hop onto it and um, channel thing, like my energy that I, that I already love doing. 
but i think that key point in which le which led me to create shop maya was actually covid <laughs> ironically covid was that time uh when my page got so much reach it got it got so much traffic and that was the point i got the most collaborations and that was the time when i was able to um channel my you know my background of marketing as well as you know my personality and everything into creating content for brands and that is when that shoe brand reached out to me and i was able to curate a line with them and that is what motivated me to create shop maya eventually so yeah i think ironically covid was that time for me when it was really beneficial for the online world uh, fantastic um so we've got a couple more questions so one of the questions is about initial investment um so uh basically it's, it's the same uh, how much initial investment was required to start up your business and i suppose on the side of that it's um how did you get your initial investment? Because there's different ways. So it'd be interesting to tell our uh, audience about your, you know, the initial investment, how you started up, uh, you know, where you got your uh, um, the funding from. So um, I, I'll start first. Um, I have no business background. My family is working class. Like my mom and my dad, they've all gone and like they've all worked all their lives um, in in. Like my mother's a teacher, my 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 father ha had a salary job, my husband as well. He has no business perspective whatsoever. So jumping into business was something was a you know was a self uh, motivation, and it was something that I wanted to do by passion. Um, even though I have a finance degree, I suck at numbers, <laughs> and I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to feel owed to someone, so I self invested into my business. I I saved up from my campaigns, um, and uh, that is how I my initial investment was about fifteen hundred two thousand pounds, and that was it. And that is how I got my first stock. And I honestly, I think that is the number that I'm still growing on eventually. But all I know is what I'm putting in and what is coming out. I don't know anything <laughs> else. <laughs> I, I do need an accountant. But uh, yeah, the feeling of not being owed to anyone, that is not, that is not, that is not what I wanted. I guess eventually, uh, when once you start growing on a bigger scale, that is when you need, um, you know, external help. But for now, Alhamdulillah, I'm okay. <laughs> Brilliant. Fantastic. Um, Zara, do you want to uh, just give any insight or Samir about uh, you know, your yeah. initial start, how you, how you overcame those challenges? Yeah, so I can um, go next. Um, for the first Treya side, it was an investment of around half a million, um, which uh, we had to most of it was towards the rent and the deposit that we had to pay a hefty one year's deposit just to secure the site as a startup. Um, so a lot of the chunk went into that. And I was lucky that, you know, my family supported me and they were the ones who, you know, um, along with my own personal saving, you know, my family uh, stepped in and my parents um, pitched in. So that has been a huge um, help. And then from there, we've just sort of reinvested in the business and then grown from that initial um, investment. Excellent, excellent. So mine is basically, obviously, it's the art business. So you don't need like a huge investment in this. I think the biggest investment in art is your time mm -hmm. because um, it's over time is you're going to you're going to perfect your skill and you're going to perfect your art. And it's the time that people are paying for. But the initial investment when I first started out, obviously, I looked at my husband as a cash machine and I was like, right, you need to invest in this. So, yep. So it was my husband that invested in mine. And with art, there's not much of an investment that you need to put. There's not like a huge chunk. And I believe in that. And coming from a business background, I've seen this my whole life, that the investment is very small, but the results are humongous. And that's the whole point of business. So both businesses that I do, the investment is small, but the results, alhamdulillah, are, are big. So, Excellent. yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. So we just got a couple more questions. Um, just so I know I'm just conscious of time. So I know you three are very busy, so I don't, don't want to overrun. Um, so we've got another question regarding your online uh, um, sort of uh, sites, your Instagram sites. 
So what advice would you give to up and coming or growing businesses on how to grow followers, how to reach out to new people and how to sort of get the name out there? On in like Instagram. On, on Instagram or online or you know, on the social media sites. I'd say I'm not, I don't, I'm not, I don't know how to use half these sites. So, you know, uh, if there's um, others, we can name them as well. I'd say be very strategic about what mm -hmm. you're going to post. Everything I post on social media, whether it's whether it's on my business page or on uh, on stories. So the way I do it is my business page. If you go on my feed, you will see everything is related to the business. But if you go on my stories, you will see I share my lifestyle um, and on my travel page, because that's a travel and lifestyle page. My lifestyle and travel is is both on stories and on a feed. But there is an intention for every post. There's an intention for every story that I put out there. I don't just post for the heck of posting. I Just because I'm on social media, people will see. I could be sat in my pajamas at home, but I posted that I'm sat in Harrods having a coffee. I've done it for a reason. And people would think I've done that in real time. I believe in become the audience you want to attract. So I am the audience that I want to attract. That's who I am on social media. On social media, I am Imanza. In real life, I'm Samara. So this is the way I differentiate between social media. And I also say, be strategic and also have a structure. So because social media can take over your life, the moment you sat there and you start scrolling, you'll just start scrolling. Or if you're just posting or what everything takes time. Posting a, a post out there, a lot of people have like um, people doing it for them. They'll have like social media experts doing it for them. But if you're doing it yourself, definitely I'd say put a structure in place. Either, either take out three days a week, uh, dedicate an hour or two hours to your social media and, and that's it and stick stick to that structure as long as you stick to that st structure and you're strategic about the points that uh, the posts that you put out there the stories that you put out there have the intent that whatever your goal is make the story about that so even if I put my children on social media and I've posted something about them there's a reason for why I've done it I've not just done it for for no reason. If I've posted that I'm out shopping or if I've posted an unboxing video or if I've posted something, it's for a reason. I've done it for a reason and it's working. So the, so basically, like I said, become the audience you want to attract. Excellent. Fantastic. Um, Zara? Yeah, I think with social media, we've um, uh, when we first launched Pia, we actually went viral on Instagram and that really gave us uh, our business the recognition and the boost. So I think it's a great platform. Um, you just have to be patient with it. It took us a time to grow our uh, Instagram profile as well, but you just have to uh, make sure you have the right target audience as well. Um, you have to be consistent with it because anytime we've seen that, you know, we're not as active on social media, it directly affects the business as well. Um, so you have to be consistent. And nowadays, I feel like it's all about TikTok, which I don't personally understand so much. But I think now TikTok is sort of taking over and it's all about the trendier videos and the reels. Um, and that's a great platform. Thanks, sir. Mom, you, I mean, I'm sure you've got some uh, great advice as well that you can give to the audience. Um, so it's a bit different for me because, of course, it's an influencer turned business, um, you know, journey. So for me, my audience largely comes from uh, my own page. And so the strategy for my own page is not really a strategy, right? It's it's my life out there. It's it's a completely different headspace. It's um, sharing all parts of my life that I want to share. And that is where the audience gets inspired. And that's how, you know, the traffic is redirected onto Shop Maya. But I really want Maya to ha have its own space and online presence. And that I tend to do, that, that will happen over time. And, you know, uh, my strategy for that should be, you know, exactly what um, the two ladies have said, that you really need to know your audience. You really need to know, um uh, the geographical locations where your products are more um popular uh where they are more reaching out to and um it's it, you just you just need to know really need to know your audience and when mm -hmm. once you know your audience you know which social media platform you need what kind of products you need to incorporate and 
do a lot of collaborations. You know, influencers are your biggest asset right now on the online world. That is what you need to um, bring your business, your products. You know, it's 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 not just word of mouth now. It's you really need to have an online presence. So I can't stress the importance of social media. You really need to have some sort of content for your products. It's really essential. Uh, that that is absolutely fantastic. You know, great advice and really you know, wise words and uh, uh, guidance to all our participants. So we're just just about close. So I'm going to close with one last question to you all. Um, in in a, in in a couple of words, what are the key things are potential new business owners or starters that need to think about? What what would you say? Maybe three words. What would you say the three key words that they need to focus on on when starting a new business? I'd say focus, mm -hmm. tunnel vision mm -hmm. equals success. Okay, sounds very good. Sarah? I would say determination, mm -hmm. hard work, and lots of patience. Yeah. Excellent, Excellent. sounds good. Mom? Yeah, I think Zara couldn't have said it better. Um, you really need consistency mm -hmm. and do not get demotivated because, you know, every business is different, but mm -hmm. eventually it all comes down to sales. Mm -hmm. So there could be every kind of month, every kind of season. So don't get demotivated. Remember why you started, why you started doing this and um, enjoy it. That's the biggest advice that I could give you. Don't get into the numbers game. Um, I know it's very easy to get pulled into um, the profit loss, you know, uh, thing. That is why I don't look at it, but uh, just enjoy it, enjoy the process. And if you feel it's exhausting, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. Well, I mean, so, yeah. I really appreciate your time. All three, you've been fantastic speakers. <laughs> and I just want to leave you with a comment that we've just had sent in to us, that all three of you make all Pakistanis super proud. So oh, that, is, that cool. is a comment we've just had coming in. So, you know, you, 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 you're, you're fighting a good fight. You're, you're flying our flag. Uh, really proud of you, all three of you. Um, and, you know, we wish you nothing but success. Um, thank you. So thank, thank, you thank you so much. Thank you.